after he was gone, and later on that evening, when everybody else in the in the tank was asleep, I got down on my knees and I said, God, I don't even know if you're real, but if you are, change my life and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Wow. That's all I said. Wow. I got up the next morning and I felt different. And I, I went out to the front of the, the cell where I was. And I said, God, I'm still in jail. You know, can, can you get me out of this? And so I went back into my cell and uh, sat down. And then I heard a deputy call my name. And I got up, went out to the front. And the deputy said, I don't know why we're doing this, but the, the sheriff has decided to let you go. Today is Testimony Tuesday. You're about to hear an interview by Pastor Adam Dragoon in Virginia Beach as he asks one of our fellowship pastors about how God has radically changed their life. Be aware that the free version of Testimony Tuesday only includes the first half of the conversation. So make sure to check the show notes to find out how to subscribe to the premium version of the Taking the Land podcast. The premium version of this episode is released before you wake up each morning and does not include any interruptions or ads. Enjoy this Testimony Tuesday on the Taking the Land podcast. Testimony Tuesday here on the Taking the Land podcast. This is Pastor Adam here with you again from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and it is time for another Testimony Tuesday. Man, have we got a guest for you today. Are you in need of a passport in a hurry? Look no further. Global Passport Express is here to help. With our efficient and reliable services, we can process your passport in as quick as seven days. That's right, just seven days. And that's not all. We specialize in visas for many countries, including popular destinations like China, India, and so much more. Whether you're planning a family vacation, a business trip, or your next mission trip, Global Passport Express is your one-stop solution for all your passport and visa needs. So why wait? Reach out to us today at 210-375-7525 to speak with one of our friendly and knowledgeable representatives. They will guide you through the process and answer any questions you may have. You can also visit our website at www.globalpassportexpress.com for more information and to start your application online. It's quick, easy, and convenient. Mention this ad and receive 10% off any of our services. Don't let time constraints hold you back from your travel dreams. Trust Global Passport Express to deliver your passport fast, hassle-free, and with a smile. Global Passport Express, your passport and visa experts. Get ready to explore the world. You're not going to believe all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. This is Pastor Les Uptain. Welcome. Welcome to the show, sir. Good to be here. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, yeah. I guess I guess we should uh, explain, uh, first of all, our connection, uh, because it goes back a ways, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Quite a ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, this goes back to the days of Skype. Before, yeah. what, imagine before. a world... Before cell phones. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Oh my gosh. Imagine so the world. My, my wife and I were missionaries in Rusay, Bulgaria, and we got a, a Skype conversation that popped up on our screen from some guy that I never heard of. Right. Less Uptain. And yeah. uh, wow, you reached out. And uh, well, what do you remember from that? I'm curious. Uh, I just remember that uh, I was considering going to Romania, and I heard that you were in Rusay. And uh, d- decided to kind of see if there was a way to go over and, you know, spy out the land or at least come over and see if I could do something, be of some assistance there in Rusay. I was always kind of enthralled by Bulgaria because when I first got saved, I was uh, involved with some outfit called uh, uh, C.S. Levet, and I don't remember the name of the, of the organization, but he was sending Bibles into Bulgaria. Oh and, wow! And what they would do is they would send you a a chapter already printed up, and you put it in an envelope and send it airmail. And they were sending Bibles in that way, a chapter at a time, to different places. And 
I got involved in that and I kind of thought it was cool. And I always wondered about Bulgaria since it was a communist nation and how, you know, that kind of went down. Wow. That's amazing. So yeah. you found us there in Bulgaria. I, I had never heard that backstory, oh, yeah. uh, but, uh, but you were, you were so generous. Uh, you and your wife came and, and preached in, in uh, Ruse, Bulgaria. Yeah. You, it was right after our first daughter was born. Yeah. So that that's going back probably 14 years now. At, at least. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so yeah. I was, um, I was wonderfully blessed by that, that, uh, act of generosity. You really, uh, came and gave us a, you know, a good boost. It was always fun to have anybody come from America. Anybody, but, yeah. But especially anybody you and, venture into a communist nation. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a blast. So, um, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been blessed to know you uh, over the years, and we wow. we just happened to see each other at the Prescott Conference uh, last yeah. year, and so yeah. that that's how this got started. So, Pastor Uptain, for anyone who is uh, not privileged enough to know you, would you just give yourself an introduction and uh, a conference-style testimony, how God's okay. moving there? My name is Les Uptain. My real name is Lassiter, but my friends call me Les. And I was saved in uh, Globe, Arizona. I have been pioneered a couple of churches, Santa Rosa, Safford, Arizona. Then, uh, I had Albuquerque uh, first pioneered by someone from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then a friend of mine, Rick Swicegood, had it for a few years, and uh, I took it over from him, and it basically was a small church, 30, 40 people, and we've now grown to over 120, and we've got three churches out now that are, two of them doing well, one of them is kind of trying to feel his way around. We have an evangelist on the field that we're uh, paying. We've been able to go to numerous countries and, and do revivals for them. I have a burden for South America. And so I go to Argentina, Chile, and now uh, into uh, Ecuador and Uruguay and preach revivals and help the churches there whenever I can. Some of those guys are really close friends. I've known them for years, preached for them for years. And so we're able to send them help and we're able to. Uh, do revivals and crusades for them. And our church is basically a really evangelistic church. We're always in the streets, always doing something. I've been saved since 19... I got saved in Globe, Arizona. And I was already saved when the church opened up. I was saved for about a year and a half and just kind of trying to keep my head above water. And then the church opened up in Globe. Jack Harris opened the church there. And then Pastor Hank Houghton took it over from him and grew up there, went out to Pioneer after being there in that church for six years. And so here we are today, San Antonio, Texas, probably one of the best places around to live. I like it here. Yeah, yeah, not bad. Well, you, And not, not only do you like living there, it sounds like God has prepared a, a great calling for you there. You know what? God has really blessed us here. I, I don't understand it. All I know is that you know, we went through some serious, heavy things uh, dealing with Albuquerque, but uh, God brought us through that. I kept my heart right. We kept our heart right. And he's brought us here after these many years. I've been here 26 years now, 26 years, and I probably die here. Okay, that's fine with me. But uh, in all that time, God has really blessed us, has taken care of us. We haven't had to worry about finances, people, things. God has really helped us. We're, we're living in, in his grace, I can honestly say. Amen. Well, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. And I, I can't wait to uh, go back in time here and, uh, and hear about all of these things that how God brought you to where you are now. Okay, so, uh, so Pastor Upton, if you could share with us uh, where and how you grew up as a little guy, what was your family life like? Well, I was raised, born and raised in Globe, Arizona, a little backwater Are you serious? Town, serious as a heart attack. And uh, I lived there all my childhood. We moved all around Arizona. My father was an itinerant construction worker, drove trucks for construction companies, built most of the highways. You know, I remember being with him when they were building Interstate 10 between Tucson and Phoenix and... Uh, Bisbee down in through that area. We lived there while he worked for the mines. Uh, we did a lot of traveling when I was a kid, a lot of moving around. 
lived in Bisbee, Globe, Sholo, uh, lived in Phoenix, Tucson. We lived all over the place and uh, grew up, finally ended up living in Globe. After my parents' divorce, I was going to school at there, went to high school, finished. I won't say finished. I, I did most of high school there. Moved out to California after I spent a little bit of time in a reform school for being a bad boy, you know, uh -oh, one of those. Uh oh, yeah. Did you have brothers in and fact, sisters? I had a brother. We a brother a year younger than I, and we both went to uh, Fort Grant Reform School together for crimes that we had committed as young thieves. Oh, <laughs> and uh, then we ended up going back a second time. And at the second time, my brother and I were separated. He went to uh, California, and I went to Oregon. We got what, what they were calling out-of-state releases, get you out of the prison system and back out perhaps in some kind of a viable family. So I was staying with my aunt and uncle in Roseburg, Oregon, went to school there for a couple of years, and then ended up coming back to Arizona, uh, staying there for part of my high school years. And then I moved to Santa Rosa where my mother lived, California, and okay. lived there for uh, six or seven years. Went into the Army at that time. It was right in the middle of the Vietnam War. Ended up going to Vietnam and uh, spent six and a half months there. Was wounded, sent home on a medevac. So I got to come home alive, which is a good thing. The heroes yeah. are still there, and they're buried. Yeah, and, yeah, definitely. And so after that, when I got home, I met my wife before I went to Vietnam. We didn't have any pledges of uh, fidelity because we didn't know each other very long. But when I came back, I was very interested in what was going on with her. So I met up with her, and we got married a month later. And uh, I got a wild hair. I decided I wanted to move back to Arizona. And I think, ostensibly, without admitting it, I was looking for my childhood, which mm. I really had missed out on. I didn't really get to enjoy it too much because of the way my parents had divorced and the stuff that was going on. But I was looking for my childhood, moved back and realized that I wasn't going to find it. Stayed there, and that's when I started hanging around with a bunch of guys that were riding motorcycles and partying and acting stupid. And, okay, uh, well, before we get to motorcycle gang chapter, okay, all right, <laughs> let, let me ask a few questions about, about this. So, okay. so how old were you when your parents got divorced? I was 13. 13. Yeah. And so it's, it sounds like that is something that puts you on the, the wrong track and kind of caused you to go down the wrong road. Definitely did. And people don't realize that a divorce always damages the children. I don't care what their ages are. Even if they're 30, 40, it still damages. But uh, it damaged every one of us. My brother never recovered. He went, he went to the dark side and stayed there. He never recovered himself until just a few days before he died. Then he got saved. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, my sister, uh, my sisters did okay. My other two brothers did okay. In fact, one of them is here now. He's saved and lives just a little bit south of us here. Um, and then I have a couple of half brothers that still live in California. They're not doing too well from what I hear. Anyway, the divorce really was a, a moment in time where uh, it wrecked us. It really did. I had no idea what I was doing from that point on. I was just kind of disoriented about life, but I didn't what? really think life through. Okay. I'm just kind of a dummy, just letting it happen to me. What well, what were the consequences relationally? Like, did you end up staying more with your mom or your dad? Stayed with mom mostly, um, uh, in California. That's why we were out there. My father was living in Arizona and stayed there. We got to see him once in a while. He was interested in us, but the way the laws were structured at the time, he had no ability to have any contact with us. So anyway, yeah. I went uh, back, to, I think, and met him later. Yeah. But what, uh, what, was, what was the time frame? Like what year did, did, that, did that happen? The divorce happened circa 19. So, yeah, okay. No, no, no. Even earlier than that, 64. Well, that that's that's fairly early, like uh, yeah. you know, be, before it was a kind of an, a widespread cancer on society. Yeah, it was. So, well, lucky you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, right. We got to feel it out for everybody, right? <laughs> so, so you, you found yourself uh, in trouble, and and uh, how did it? Was it that you 
were in the wrong group of people or you were just too much free time or like, how, how did you find yourself there? Well, I did have some bad associations. One kid was, uh, was one that my father would try to keep us away from, but we would sneak out and hang out with him. And we got in trouble with him every time we went out. And so that uh, it was basically the wrong people. And I didn't really have any guidance. My father was always working. So, and if he could have been around, I'm sure he would have done more and done better. We would have come out better, but he wasn't around. And so because of that, we ended up going wild. So how old were you when you went into the military then? I was 17. Okay, so those years from 13 to 17 were kind of chaotic for you, it sounds like. They were. The hippie movement was in full bloom, and I was living in Santa Rosa from 14 until the time I went in the military. And uh, Santa Rosa was right in the middle of the whole hippie thing, San Francisco, 60 miles away. And so it was party, party, party. And all I can say about that is that it was one drug after another. And the music, I was a music aficionado and i still am i really like music and uh in fact i could probably throw down with anybody who thinks they know the history of rock and roll okay come on (laughs) so um so i got involved with a couple of guys that had a band and uh played with them once in a while but mostly just hung out with them because of the parties the drugs the girls all that stuff uh and i became a little bit of a hippie myself so i was really into the whole scene and um but i finally got tired of it though and just decided i'm gonna go in the army and see if i can straighten okay. myself up because i knew i was jacked up okay did did you have a uh, history of of military service in your family no my father served in world war ii but he never talked about it yeah yeah so okay so if you if you gave us a top three of your of, of the favorite bands during the hippie movement <laughs> What were they? Oh, gosh. Uh, they would have to be uh, Led Zeppelin. Ooh, come on. Uh, Cream at that time was a favorite. Jimi Hendrix. Oh, nice. Did you did you ever see them in concert? Never got to see Cream or Hendrix, but I was able to see a number of others. Doobie Brothers and Chambers Brothers and Steppenwolf and uh, It's a Beautiful Day and a number of others that came through. Santa Rosa. It had a pretty big venue there for music. So this is a big difference between the world as it was at that time and the world as it is now. Uh, People are not are are. It's not that they're not musical, but they're not connected to the music in the same way. And I think not because they don't play instruments. That's right. That's right. They sing to tapes. So what what instrument did you play? I I played the drums primarily, and I started playing the bass a little bit later on. Okay. Okay. Well, that could take you places in a rock and roll generation, right? It it did. <laughs> I admit it got me into parties at least. Okay, okay, but uh, but you got tired of that pretty quickly. Sounds like really didn't have much of a connection with any bands that were were forming at the time. Most of them were all formed already full, and uh, not having any friends that were loose and playing instruments, I never really put anything together. I tried to once in Santa Santa Rosa, but it never really gelled. Okay. Okay. It wasn't until I got out to Arizona that we started putting things together. Okay. So an, another important question from from this history: Do you do you have any recollection uh, during your childhood years or even in the teen years where uh, do you have any s- spiritual connections? Do you ever have any religious background, or did you ever go to church at all? We were raised as Mormons. Serious. And- yeah, my father and mother were, well, my father was a basically a Jack Mormon, but his mother, my grandma, she was uh, really into making us go to church, and it uh, happened to be she was a Mormon, and they had a history uh, centered in Mesa, Arizona, all around uh, Safford, Arizona, is all Mormon primarily, and uh, the family came from there, and so she really wanted to educate us in the Mormon way. And so we went to church whenever we were around grandma, funerals and Easter and stuff like that. But if we stayed at grandma's house, everybody would go into church. One of the most boring things I ever did in my life, Mormon church will make you so bored that you'll sleep. You'll go to sleep easily. That's all I can say. You know, all they can talk about is Joseph Smith, like he was God or something. 
And uh, and I, I know Mormon doctrine. I can tell you, I know what Mormon doctrine is, but uh, it never appealed to me at all. There was no such thing as even a concern about who Jesus was, what your sins were all about. So that was my spiritual content up until the time I was about 12 years old. When I went to reform school the first time, there was a, a Baptist preacher that had a burden for those kids. And he preached every Sunday faithfully in the theater there and had a large captive audience. They made most of the kids go to his church. So there were 300 kids in a Baptist church and this guy's preaching his heart out and most of them are ignoring him. But uh, I listened. I, the old boy only preached salvation and the cross. And uh, I got a good education in the cross at that age. But being 12 years of age, you know, I prayed and got saved. And I, I felt it and lived it for about two hours. And because, you know, you're in a form school. How are you going to how are you going to live for God if you have no support system whatsoever? It's just you against the masses. And I wasn't strong enough, spiritually speaking, to even think about trying to live for God. So I, I didn't hear anything more about Jesus until I was about maybe 16 or 17. Uh, wow. and that was just before I went in the service. Okay. So you were exposed to the gospel through that reform school, but, yeah. uh, but there was also a huge Jesus people movement going on at the time. There was. And before I went into the service, I had a friend named Richard Johnson. We hung out together all the time. His grandmother was another, she was a holy roller. She went to an assembly of God there in Santa, Santa Rosa that was doing then what we have now. Wow. I kid you not. They had the worship. They had evangelism. They had the Holy Ghost. They had testimonies that uh, people were getting saved like crazy in that church. And I went to that church several times because in order to be able to hang out with Richard, Grandma said, you're going to church because he was living with Grandma. So I heard the gospel there quite a bit. And I'm, I'm I was constantly... Uh, reminiscing about the fact when I was in Santa Rosa about the fact that that assembly of God church had what we have now. It was amazing. You couldn't come away. You couldn't come through Santa Rosa without somebody witnessing to you. Wow. That's cool. And the church grew. It was huge. Uh, 14, 1500 people pretty quickly. They built a big church right outside of town. It's now a, an arts, a fine arts center of some kind. And uh, now it's, uh, there's not even a vestige of the church left, except for some little group that calls themselves Victory Outreach of some kind. But uh, I got to hear the gospel there many times, but I didn't commit myself at that time. Oh, okay. So, so you had heard about it, but you you didn't uh, ever make a decision to follow Jesus at that point. No, I didn't, and the reason was because I really did like my partying. I liked it. You were in love with your sin. Well, there's pleasure in sin for a season. And if, That's you, right. didn't, if you didn't have pleasure, you didn't do it right. <laughs> Sorry, but it's the truth. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, the, what the, what Jesus said, the light has come to the world, but uh, the men love the darkness. That's right. That's right. They love darkness. Sure, um, what was your motivation to uh, to go into the military then? I was really bothered by the whole communist movement. I had been watching communism for years. And when I was a child, I was impressed by what uh, Khrushchev said when he banged his shoe on the, the podium there at the UN and said, we will bury you, you know. And, and then he began to talk about how they were going to do it without firing a shot. And in my young 13, 14 year old mind, that really did uh, hit. And so I began to note what they were doing and note their, their whole world domination kick. You know, and, and I followed them for years, and it finally came to a head in my thinking that we were in Vietnam to keep the communists from coming here. And I thought, well, this is a worthwhile enterprise. So uh, I went down and enlisted and uh, went to basic training in Fort Lewis, Washington, then went to uh, advanced infantry training a couple months later, Fort Benning, Georgia, and then we were shipped over to Vietnam. And that was in 1970, May of 1970. And yeah, what that motivated was... me was the whole communist thing. I had, you know, I, I knew what communism was, and I didn't like it. And I knew it was a that it was a force to be reckoned with because it was uh, beginning to have its impact throughout the world. And I didn't like it. 
Well, that's really interesting because you were motivated by the philosophy or or maybe the Against the politics the behind it. Yeah, right. I thought yeah. America was the best place on the planet, and and I still do. But uh, knowing what they believe and what we believe are just worlds apart, and realizing that if they ever had a chance to take over here, we'd be in trouble. Well, that, that tells me something interesting about you as a person that you were you were uh, had the conviction to to go fight and put your life on the line for like a political cause. That that's interesting. I I wonder how many other people at the time were were joining for the same reasons. Uh, there were quite a few, but I don't think I thought of it that way. I think uh, I thought of it more as uh, I just want to kill some commies. I okay. still think it, all right, you know. I'd yeah, like yeah. To, I'd like to go over to uh, the Middle East and smoke some camels myself, you know? So you're just a, a red-blooded patriot. Red-blooded patriot. Well, that yeah. that's amazing. So, But that was really like during the heat of, of the Vietnam conflict, wasn't it? It was, and during the heat of the Cold War. Yeah. Yeah, so, that was right in the middle of it. For those that are in the know, um, maybe you can uh, explain where you served, where you went, and how you got injured. Well, uh, basic training was at Fort Lewis, Washington, and AIT was at Fort Benning, and it was a radio and communication school. I was going to carry a radio when I got over there, but I made the uh, I made the uh, or took the opportunity to go to uh, what we called a shake and bake school, which is uh, a non commissioned officer. Uh, school where you spend three months in training and you come out as an E5, which is a hard stripe sergeant and, and become uh, someone with some authority and responsibility. I uh, went to that school, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then we went over to Vietnam after that. I, when we went to Vietnam, I went over with the 198th Light Infantry, which was based out of Fort Benning, Georgia. Then when I got there, we came into Cameron Bay. That's where they brought us into country. Uh, flew over on Capital Airlines at the time. Uh, got out in Cameron Bay. They flew us up to Chulai up in i which is up in the north part of the country. And uh, that was home base, Chulai with 198 Light Infantry. And uh, at first, when I first got there, I was just uh, in the in the rear area doing, you know, clerical things in, around the office there, the clerk's office, and doing the other things that we had to learn to do being in country. One of the things we had to learn to do was burn the waste in the in the uh, toilets and the outhouses and uh, try to uh, patrol the area, go on patrols uh, in the, inside, the, inside the perimeter, do guard duty at the perimeter, uh, basically just hang around and uh, get off at five and go down to the beach and smoke pot and drink beer. <laughs> sounds, now, really, that's sounds pretty good. Uh, yeah. And then after being there for about a month and having learned the ropes, so to speak, they told me one day, hook up, you're going out. So, uh, I got all my equipment, you know, rifle and backpack and all the gear that I needed, joined our company out in the, what we call the boonies. And uh, our job was to establish fire bases up on mountaintops around the area. And so what we would do was we would uh, CA or combat assault out into a uh, an area around a mountain or around a hill where we wanted to go. And generally, because it was a pretty much a free fire zone, there, sh there shouldn't have been too much activity there, but there always was. Um, we would either move over toward the area that we wanted to to take over and set up a fire base there for artillery or if we had to fight our way over which we never really did have to uh most of the time it was pretty easy to just walk in set up and then start doing our business so we established uh LZ Sari we established Kitra we established uh several we established several what we called LZs and fire bases what they were was they were just spots on a mountaintop that had room enough for a, a landing zone for helicopter in and out, and uh, large enough to bring in th three or four pieces of artillery, which would be 105 howitzers, and in some cases, one. but mostly that's what we did, establishing fire bases. We went out on a few patrols here and there, 
had contact here and there. And in that contact, usually there was there was something driving it. We were also tasked to find bases of operation that the uh, Viet Cong or the NVA were using. And in one area that we went to one day, this was in August of 1970, we went into a a place that we were told had some NVA activity and that we were going to look for their uh, base. And we did find it, although we didn't find exactly where it was, but we did find it because we began to draw fire almost immediately after going into the place. And uh, the last time I remember contact was we, we were going down a trail. And uh, next thing I know, you know, we're, we're hearing weapons firing at us. Everybody's down on the floor and uh, looking around, trying to figure out where we are, what was going on. So we just started firing back, you know, just blindly. We had no idea where the enemy was. And uh, finally, we they settled out or they, they quit firing at us. It was like they took off. They left. It wasn't an ambush that was uh, uh, pre-planned. It was just they ran into us. We ran into them. And so everybody was shooting at each other. So they left, got out of the area. We went back to our base of operation there on that mountain. And then we we went back the next day to the same area. We should never have gone back to the same area uh, because habits kill you. And so we're going down the same trail. And this time <clears throat> there were some booby traps set on the trail. And we call them IED now because of the Geneva Convention, you know. But these booby traps were set along the trail. And I was walking, not point, but I was the second man. The point man was ahead of me about 15 feet as we're going down this trail. And we're we're in a long line going down the trail. And the, the point man must have hit, the best I can figure, he must have hit the tripwire and didn't feel it and didn't see it and kept walking. And I was coming up behind him. And I looked down to my right. And as I looked down to my right, I saw what looked like a sea rations can. And I watched it explode. So it got me from the waist down. I've got about six long scars on my legs. I have a nice long one here. So, you know, next thing I know, I'm out and I'm waking up and I'm figuring what's going on here. What happened? And the uh, medic is putting compress patches on me. And uh, and I, I remember waking up and looking down at my legs and they're a bloody mess. And I'm thinking, and then I said, oh, my God. I said, oh, my God. You know, and it didn't dawn on me that God was God was listening. Wow. The next thing I know, I'm seeing red. I, I feel like I'm starting to fade because I'd lost a lot of blood. And uh, next thing I know, I feel this wash from these helicopter blades. You know, you're laying in a 130-degree jungle, and it's hotter than fire. You're sweating. You're burning up. You're hurt. You know, and you don't know what's going on. And then you feel this helicopter wash and it just makes, it revives you, man. It brought me back to life. Wow. It was cool. It was nice, you know. So next thing I know, I'm on the helicopter back at, uh, at Chulai 27 Surgical Hospital. And they uh, went in, took out all the shrapnel and put my legs in cast because I had, I had to keep my knees from moving because a lot of the shrapnel went into my knees. And so uh, I wake up in the hospital. Next thing I know, they're sending me to Camp Zama, Japan. I'm going to be in the hospital there for a while. And I spent about two weeks there before they sent me home. Uh, when they sent me home, they sent me first to first to Lackland Air Force Base, which is right here in San Antonio. And I was able to meet some friends of mine who had gone in the Air Force during that time. And I met them here at Lackland Air Force Base while I was, you know, in the hospital. Um, then they sent me to, uh, Fort Bliss, where I was in William Beaumont General Hospital for about a week, week and a half. And then they finally decided to send me to Letterman out in San Francisco, which was close to where my family was. And so I spent about three and a half, four months there. And after I got out of the hospital there, I still had a cast on my left arm because it was broken. I decided I didn't want any more of this army stuff, so I went AWOL. Serious? Yeah, and I was AWOL for about two months. And the reason I went AWOL was because uh, they told me that my next duty station was going to be Fort uh, something, Colorado. 
Fort Collins. And I didn't particularly want to go to Colorado. I'd heard there was snow and stuff like that up there, you know, and I didn't like that. <laughs> so, uh, but I didn't want to go to the duty station they had assigned me to because of the job they wanted me to take there. And uh, so I just went AWOL. Wow. And so a uh, question for you. So with, uh, with life threatening injuries like that, did it, did it ever pass through your mind? Like, were you having to deal with the possibility of death? And what did you think of that? I did think of death when I said, Oh my God. And I, you know, I woke up and I said, Oh my God, but I didn't really think I was going to die. I, I, till my vision started fading. And when my vision started fading, I thought, this ain't good. And then the helicopter, of course, comes in, revives me, and I didn't think about it anymore. And I really didn't. I didn't think about hell. I didn't think about, oh, my God, I'm going to die, Lord. You know, I, I didn't, to be honest. If I had died in that moment, I probably would have gone to hell. Wow. God's mercy, huh? God's mercy. He was yeah. just gracious. And it was after I got out of the hospital in San Francisco that I started hearing about Jesus again, because the Jesus movement wasn't over; it was right in its in its peak. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell tell so us about that. Everywhere you go, well, everywhere we went, you know, someone was throwing the one way sign to you, you know, and and you know, I kind of figured out that means that they they're into this Jesus thing, man. And again, I had another friend that I was hanging out with who had to go to church because. His grandma wanted him to go to church. <laughs> Another friend. Imagine that. I think God was really trying to to get to me all those years, and I just wasn't listening. Wow. Wow. So I did so, hear it many times. So what did it take to get through uh, to get through to you? Okay. Well, that's another story altogether. My wife and I had finally, you know, gotten married and moved to Arizona. And in Globe, I met all my friends and and. Got a good job at the mines, making uh, good money working for the copper mines, and started hanging around with a certain group of people. And I had an aunt who lived there in in Miami, which is close by. And uh, she was. So a, I guess I guess we we should uh, you should explain to the audience like what is the situation of Globe, Arizona? I I know it only because I've okay. driven through the uh, <laughs> the the yeah. highway. But uh, yeah. but it is just a tiny little town, isn't it? Well, it's a little town of about seven thousand people, and it and its its main uh, economic driver is the copper mine, and the copper mines are it, basic ownership of the little town of Miami, which is nearby. So between the two towns, there's about twelve thousand people all together. Most of them work at the mines. They're six miles apart, and the mines are a big producer of jobs. Um, but they are little dinky towns and if the mines weren't there there wouldn't be anything there because it's just a dusty desert town at the base of some nice mountains that's about it yep that's globe and it's got got great water from wells they have wonderful water matter of fact it was that water that closed down the mine the shaft mine they had in globe that was producing gold and silver but the water was so intense they could couldn't pump it out and it still fills those up today wow so, so, yeah. but this is where you grew up, and so you had some some uh, attachment to that place, and you you got on the the company working in the mine at the time. I did, yeah. I went to work for the mine at uh, seventy three, nineteen seventy three. In fact, when I when I first moved there in nineteen seventy one, I went to an electronics school that uh, the Arizona Manpower Development was trying to give on the job training for people who didn't have a, 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 a career. So I took that six, eight months of school, learned electronics, uh, and started servicing television for Philco up in Flagstaff. So I would drive up to Flagstaff, work for the week, and spend the night at Oak Creek Canyon, just camping out and fishing. And then on weekends, I'd come back home and uh, spend the paycheck. But then I finally ended up getting a job there at the mines and started there in 1973, worked myself, worked my way from the bottom uh, in the smelter up to the top, which is the cranes. And I uh, was making pretty good money. Well, and uh, also some dynamics have changed because you, you got married. And so yeah. 
Well, what kind of effect did that have on you? Well, I, I had to finally settle down and share stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. Well, and, well, it was. Me and my wife were, were okay for the first year or so, but we started drinking a lot and started doing a lot of, you know, drugs. And and we weren't shooting up or doing cocaine, but we, we liked the hallucinogens. You know, we liked the THC and, and LSD, and we liked... Uh, weed and all that kind of stuff and uh then she ended up getting a job having a job offer at a, a bar tending bar because she kind of knew how to she knew how to mix drinks man her mother taught her really well you know but she takes this job and it was from that point that we started fighting pretty intensely because i was suspicious and uh, she was innocent but i was suspicious and so it got crazy and we were at the point of breakup when me and some friends of mine who smoked weed together a lot and rode motorcycles together a lot had gone down to Superior about 40 miles away and scored a couple of pounds of weed. And we brought it back. We're selling it all. Well, we had sold most of it and had just a little bit of it left. And we decided to park in a, a dark parking lot underneath some trees and light up a few doobies, you know. So we parked there and started rolling them up and next thing you know there's these lights in both sides of the the van we were sitting in and there's policemen on both sides and they're they're undercover they're not wearing police clothing no badges or anything but uh they shine it right in our eyes and it that kind of freaks you out because we're hiring a kite and you get these big bright lights in your eyes so we really did feel like deer in the headlights and so uh the policeman says get out of the car and so, you know, like good little boys, we obeyed and we we figured these are cops, these are serious. Uh, I get out on the left side, I'm driving my van. My partner is sitting on the right side. He gets out over there and he grabs the bag of weed as he's getting out. And as soon as he gets out, he throws it down into the creek. The policeman that had me and bringing me around to that side saw him throw it down in the creek and then told his buddy, he says, listen, Keep this, keep these guys here. I'm going to go find what he threw. So the cop is, is going down into the, the creek. While he's going into the creek, my partner takes off running. And he's six foot three. As he had long legs. You weren't catching him anytime soon. <laughs> so he took off. The cop comes back up out of the creek and he does find the weed that the guy threw down there. And he hands it hands his service revolver to the guy that was with him and tells him, keep him here. I'm going after his partner. Well, it turns out, and I figured out, this guy is a ride-along. He's not a deputy. So when the other cop is gone, I looked at him and I said, what do you think you're doing? He says, well, I'm keeping you here until your partner comes back. And I said, well, how are you going to keep me here? He said, well, I've got this. And I knew he didn't want to use it. And I said, well, am I under arrest? He says, I am not telling you anything until your partner gets back. And I said, well, if I'm not under arrest, I'm out of here. Wow. So I walked around the front of the van, opened the door, got in, fired it up. And as I'm, as I'm turning the van on, I look out the side window and I see this flashlight bobbing up and down. The other cop's coming back. He hadn't found my partner. So he's coming back and he's running full tilt. So I backed out and slammed the, you know, the gas down out toward the highway. And as oh I'm headed gosh. toward, the, I almost got to the highway, which is about 300 yards away. And uh, he emptied the, his revolver in the back of my van. He missed my head by about three inches. Oh my god! Because one of the bullets bounced off the mirror case. So he almost had me. But anyway, he empties his revolver in the back of the van. I f drive up in the hills and park the van and get out and walk back down toward where all of it was happening. And I got up on top of a hill so I could see there. And turns out my partner's hiding up on top of that hill. Oh, man. Great minds yeah. think alike. Yeah. So so we're sitting there talking about what to do. He says, well, let's go to your house because my house was only about a half a mile away. And we could walk up the road there and get to it pretty easily. So we did that. And we figured that they'd already figured out who we were, where we were going to be. And so I had a couple of guns at my house and we were, we we're both Vietnam vets. So we thought, well, we'll just wait for them. <laughs> oh bring God. it, bring it. But they never did come. 
And the reason was they found my van and they impounded it. And then they started, you know, running a make on the, on the uh, tags and figured out who I was, but they didn't know where I lived because the last address on that, uh, those tags were at another location. So they weren't going to find me anytime soon, but they knew where I worked. And it just so happens that my partner worked there too. And we were on the same shift. Oh man. So one night we're on graveyard shift. And I noticed my partner disappeared. He saw the sheriff coming up the hill and I had no idea what was going on. I I'm visited by the general foreman. He comes and says, Hey, they need to talk to you down in the office. And I'm thinking, now this is odd because they never talked to you in the office on graveyard. There's nobody there. So I thought, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> and I kind of blindly and dumbly went down there and sure enough, it's a the sheriff. They slapped the cuffs on me, take me off to jail. And I'm in the jailhouse for the next few days. I had had an arraignment on Monday morning, and they uh, basically told me what the charges were and uh, what they were going to do, that they weren't going to let me go. I couldn't get out. I could get out on bail if I had $50,000, because I think they figured they were going to send me up. They wanted to get rid of me, because we were a nuisance in the town. We were always a nuisance, and the four of us were always riding through town making noise drinking in the bars, starting fights and stuff like that. So they wanted to get rid of us. And I was the first one. So I'm in jail. I'm sitting there Monday morning after having had an arraignment. And, uh, Sunday morning. I'm sorry, Sunday, because they did a special arraignment for me. They called a judge in, had the judge tell me what was going to happen, send me back into the jail. And as I'm sitting in the jail, an old man comes in and starts talking to me about Jesus. Oh, wow. And he's, he's a Spanish minister of an assembly of God in Miami. And he goes to that jail every Sunday. Well, I happen to be standing there at the front. He starts talking to me about how he got saved 25 years previous in the same cell that I was in. No way. And he was a hopeless alcoholic, had cirrhosis of the liver, and couldn't use his right arm because it was so far gone. And told me how that he had just read a simple tract that told him Jesus loved him, he could get saved, have all his sins forgiven, be delivered from all of his bondages. And he said, I had no more sense than to just believe it. So I prayed, I got saved. I got out, went to a doctor. He said, my cirrhosis was gone. My right arm I could use again. So he's telling me that God did miracles for him and he got saved. And so, you know, I thought, yeah, okay, look, it's okay. You're an old guy. You need to be talking about God. You're going to be meeting him pretty soon, but I'm young. I got a lot of life to live. So, you know, I don't want to hear it. So he said, all right, listen, you don't have to live this way. You give your life to Jesus. And watch what'll happen. And then he gave me a tract and it kind of had a sinner's prayer on it, but you know, I didn't pay much attention to that after he was gone. Uh, and later on that evening, when everybody else in the, in the tank was asleep, I got down on my knees and I said, God, I don't even know if you're real, but if you are, change my life and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Wow. That's all I said. Wow. I got up the next morning and I felt different. And I, I went out to the front of the, the cell where I was and I said, God, I'm still in jail. You know, can, can you get me out of this? And so I went back into my cell and uh, sat down and then I heard a deputy call my name. And I got up, went out to the front, and the deputy said, I don't know why we're doing this, but the, the sheriff has decided to let you go. We're going to fingerprint you and let you go. And um, they did. My wife came to pick me up, and she looked at me, and she said, what's uh, different about you? And I said, well, I don't know. Well, wait a minute. You know, I got saved while I was in jail. And she looked at me, and she rolled her eyes. And we drove off and she said later on that I always thought you were crazy. And when you said you got saved, I knew it. So that's the story of how I got saved. Really? I lost you, bro. Mm -hmm. It appears I had an internet outage. Ah, that can at, happen. At an inopportune moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me go through the last part of it. I think I know where it, uh, where it went out. Uh, okay. I was in the jail. The uh, judge had told me that I couldn't get out unless I put up a large amount of money. And I didn't have the money. Nobody did have the money. So I'm in jail. I wake up the next morning. Prayed, I prayed the night before when the old man came and talked to me. I decided to get saved. So I got on my knees and prayed. 
I woke up the next morning and I felt different. And I looked around and I said, I'm still in jail. This is not good. So I said, God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. I don't care what you want. I no sooner said that than a deputy comes walking up the stairs and he says, I don't know why the sheriff is doing this, but we're going to let you go. There you go again. But we're going to let you go. And so they let me out of jail. My wife came, picked me up, sits down in the car, looks at me and says, what's different about you? And I said, I don't know. And then it dawned on me. I said, well, I got saved while I was in jail. And she rolled her eyes and looked at me, rolled her eyes and said, oh, no. And she told me later, she said, I always thought you were crazy. But I knew you were when you said you got saved. <laughs> and so she took her stuff. A week later, she waited till I was at work, took her stuff, took my car and left. She was gone for a month and a half, and then she came back, and we got back together again. What? Why did, did she, she leave? Go? Because she thought I was crazy. Wow. She really did think I lost my mind. <laughs> she did. But she kept connection with some of the people here in town, and they said they had told her, well, apparently he's going to church. He's doing a lot of stuff different. He's not even smoking anymore. He's not even partying anymore. So she came back to town. And we got back together, and that's another story in itself. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, we got back together 50, well, 52 years now. That's amazing. Well, how, how did <coughs> how did you get connected to the door then that was there in Globe? Well, I was going to a Baptist church, and um, the Baptist church was the only thing really happening. They, and the guy was a preacher. He was a good preacher. And so I was getting fed. But there was a young man there named Ed Kuhneman. Ed Kuhneman was from Prescott, had gotten saved in Prescott, and went to ASU, got a teaching degree, was still saved. The only job he could get was a teaching job in Globe, Arizona. So he took it. He was locked into the Baptist church there. Pastor Mitchell said, just go to that Baptist church. He did. And when I got saved, I got to know him. And uh, him... Him and a, and a couple of other guys that I met there were instrumental in the whole thing. Rick Swicegood was going there, and there was another kid that played the bass. Rick played guitar, and I played the drums. We put together a, a gospel rock band. Oh, wow. Back in a time when nobody really was doing rock except Prescott. And so we started doing music. The Baptist Church let us play at their uh, sleep-in they have for teens, which is an unwise thing. but. Anyway, we came in and played there, and uh, so the word got around that we had a band. Ed found out that we had a band. He said, oh, no, this is great. He calls Pastor Mitchell and says, Pastor, we've already got a rock band, and nobody here wants them. And he says, well, we, we were thinking about planting Jack Harris down there. Jack Harris, of course, was a musician, and so he very quickly volunteered to come and open the church there in Globe, and we had a music scene immediately. Me and Rick and this other kid had put together a number of songs already, so we had a we had a music scene every Friday and Saturday night from the beginning. Unbelievable. And wow. So Ed Kuhneman was the one who was instrumental in getting a church planted there, and uh, I, I'd been saved about a year and a half when that happened. Wow, what a miracle. So me and so Rick became the first, and our family became the first uh, members of the church there. So, so how did we go from your wife thinking you're crazy— to her coming back and <laughs> uh, and figuring out that you're not crazy. Okay, she was out there in Alpine, Texas for about a month and a half. I looked everywhere for her. Her mother didn't even know where she was. She was staying away from me. Uh, but she came back to town. And the night before she came back, and I had been going out in, uh, for the past month, I'd been going out in the hills and praying and laying hold of God. I said, God, I want my wife back. I want to at least know that she wanted to stay with me and get saved, or does she want a divorce? If she wants a divorce, fine, no problem. But I just got to know. Well, after praying that way for about a month, uh, one night I had a dream, and in the dream I saw her face, and she said, I'll be back tomorrow. And I thought, that's weird. Uh, anyway, uh, I was at work. Uh, no, no, I went up to a friend's house, and I was going to go up and witness to him. His name was Charlie Baker. And I was going to witness to him. So I went to his house and I got to talking to him. And he said, uh, we talked about what had happened, how I had gotten saved. 
and how my wife had taken off. He says, yeah, what does she look like? And I described her and he says, really? He said, do you have a Volkswagen, little blue Volkswagen? I said, yeah. He says, you know, that's funny. There's a girl came to work last night at Dastardly Dan's downtown, which is a bar. And she looks just exactly like what you're talking about <laughs> and drives a little blue Volkswagen. And her house is right down there. And he pointed down the hill. And I could look down there and see my car. Well, anyway, I said, thanks, Charlie. I'll see you later. Amazing. And I went down there. And sure enough, it was my car. I went and knocked on the door. Got no answer. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I got no answer. So I knocked three or four times. Gave her a good 10 minutes to answer the door. But being a bartender, she'd be up late and get up late. So I figured she'd probably still sleep in. And then I thought, now I've knocked enough times that she should be awake by now. And so I thought she's getting out the back. So I went around the back to the back door and it didn't look like it had been open, but I heard some noise inside. So I kicked the door open and I kicked the door open and she's standing there looking at me, bleary eyed. And I oh said, my gosh. Honey, I just got to know, what are you going to do? And she goes, give me a couple of weeks, okay? So I said, all right, that's fair. And she began to tell me what she was doing. I invited her to the church. No, she didn't want to go. I said, well, I'm getting baptized next week, so maybe you want to go to that. She said, all right, I'll think about it. But in the meantime, she says, I'm doing some parties here tonight. You're welcome to come if you want, you know. And so sure enough, she's doing a party there that night. Uh, three or four friends of hers and some other people. and. So I showed up, and I've been saved all of a month and a half now. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know how the devil works, but I, I'm starting to get a pretty good idea. I felt like you're trying to draw me back into this thing, aren't you? And so I go, and they hand me a beer. I start drinking it, and I didn't like the taste of it. So I sat it down, began to talk, started, started talking to people about Jesus in this party, and they started getting a little bit mad at me. Because I'm wrecking their party, man. Wow. So I ended up leaving. I ended up leaving. And I told her I'd come back and see her the next day. And so I was giving her some time to kind of think things through. Her friends immediately didn't like me because I'm trying to preach to all of them. And then I had a cousin. She had a, a country band. And they were going to do a job out at a place called South 40, which is outside of town and asked me if I would play drums for him. And I'm, you know, I'm dumb. I have no idea. It's a bar, you know, but I think I can handle that. Well, I asked Sally if she wanted to go with me. I'm going to play with these guys. And it's a country western band. They don't smoke dope, man. They just drink beer. That's it. So <laughs> I go there. My friend, my old partner, knows that I'm going to be playing. So he shows up at this bar, and we're playing country and western music. And uh, every bit of it was good. It was a good band. Uh, and then we took a break, and I went out to the car with my partner and smoked a joint. And I thought, that was stupid. I should never have done that. But anyway, I went back in. I sat down by Sally. She's sitting at the end of the bar, and she's drinking a, a beer. And I looked over at her, and I said, what? She says, you blew it. She knew what I did. I go back to the band, sit down to to play. And what do they want to play? They want to play, I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm dying. And so they're looking back at me as they're singing and they're playing. I'm stoned as I can be. This is, it oh got my me. Gosh. Sinners are telling me, you're jacked up, dude. Why'd you do that? <laughs> but they didn't say it, but they're looking at me like, you big dummy. And the rest of the night went pretty good because I started coming down after that. But uh, they never had me play for them again. <laughs> but it, it was funny. Here's sinners are preaching to me. And I knew I shouldn't have gotten loaded. Wow. So, what uh, a I lesson. Went, yeah, what a lesson. So I went out to my friend's house, my partner's house. He said, all my buddies are going to be there. You can preach to them if you want. And so I said, okay. So I, little did I know he set me up. So I go out there. They're all sitting around in a circle in the house. I'm sitting right here. My partner's right here. And we're, they're passing a joint. They start passing a joint from my right all the way around. And there's about 20 people in that room. And I'm getting ready to preach. And my partner hands me the joint. 
And without thinking, I take a hit off of it. And then I go and pass it on. And he looks at me and he goes, gotcha. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it ruined my, I couldn't preach to him now. What am I going to say? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what right. am I going to say? So I got up and left. You know, I got up and left. And then my wife decided that she would go to my baptism that week. So she did. And while I was getting baptized, she's weeping. But by the time I got out of the tank and came down, she'd kind of cleaned up. And so I said, well, let's go for a camping trip because we loved camping. So we drove up to Payson the next day. And when I got out to go into the store and get some lunch stuff, you know, she sat in the car. And when I came back out, she had prayed and gotten saved. What? Yeah. It's like it, God is orchestrating this whole thing. He crowds me into How did the that corner happen? of the captive audience. Yeah, I I don't know. I I had told her how to get saved, so she knew it was a simple prayer. But the backstory for her is that she was raised at a Presbyterian church that preached the gospel in Santa Rosa. But her mom left it after, you know, after, when she was about 11 or 12. So she knew the gospel, and she knew how to get saved. And then, of course, I had told her, well, this is real simple. You just pray and repent of your sins. So while I was in the store, she got saved. That was in just like that, huh? That was in November. God must have been of, dealing with her. Yeah, no, he must have. No, November of nineteen seventy. And so, I got saved so in September, she got saved in November. So that gets you guys on the same page together. Yeah, we started going to the Baptist church, and we stayed there until the church in Globe opened, and then we immediately moved over there. You were I there from the on the job. You were there from, from the, the very beginning of the Globe Church. Very beginning. Yep. Very beginning. Well, I, I tell you, all come in. I saw Joe Zebel come in, him and his wife. I prayed with him. Sally prayed with her. Amazing. Yeah, we, we've and done several. Yeah, we've done several interviews with people who got saved uh, in the Globe Church. And just it, it's amazing yeah. to me to think about the impact of that church uh, on our fellowship and on world evangelism. Yeah. I mean, there's a TJ Horta who uh, is a missionary in Vietnam Overseas. of all places. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, of all places. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, Here you what, have what the Lula Globe Church Bato. has been able to He's, do. Uh, yeah. Well, over the years, they've planted 42 churches. Incredible. Over the years. Not all of them have made it, and there really are only about 12 today that are still uh, still in existence. And they're still trying to plant churches, which is a great thing. Uh, we go to their harvesters every year in, in January. What a miracle. Lula Bato, yeah. That's another story. Did he ever tell you his story? How he so, got saved? I, we actually just had his son, Louis Jr., on the show. So oh, yeah. I got I got a great. partial story from him, but uh, it would be great to have him come on the show as well. Oh, get him. Because Louis, when Louis first came into the church, he, he didn't want to come. But his girlfriend from high school had gotten saved, and he just wanted her. But she said, no, 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 no way, buddy. You got to get saved. I don't want you any other way. So he, he wouldn't get saved for the longest time. Well, we worked in the same smelter, and he asked wow. me if he could come up on my crane one day. He wanted to see how the pit looked over all those converters. And so I said, yeah, come on up. And so he comes up in the crane. We're in an air-conditioned box going up and down, you know, over the converters and the furnaces. And he's looking inside one converter. It's 2,200 degrees, yellow hot. The flame is going blue. That's how hot it is. And he looks in there and says, man, that's hot. I said, that's how hell will be, but you won't be able to die. And he says, let me off this crane right now. And I didn't hear I didn't hear from him for another week, man. But he shows up at church and gets saved. It's like, yes. He'll tell you that that statement was probably the most instrumental in him getting saved. He said, I did not want to go to hell. Oh, my gosh. What an incredible story. We're going to okay. take a quick break so that uh, we can uh, come back after the break. This will be this will be the end of the show for our uh, free listeners. But if you are a premium subscriber, we're going to we're going to talk about what happened to you after salvation, uh, your call to the okay. ministry and uh, okay. your experience as 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 a pastor and your and all of that stuff. If you want to be a part of that, um, there are subscribe links in the show notes below. We would love to have you join us. Everything that we do is for world evangelism. We don't keep 
uh, any of it for ourselves. It is all going to our Thursday night offering. Uh, and so uh, for those who are going to say goodbye at this time, we thank you for listening. Thanks for coming along for the ride. And uh, we'll be right back for our premium listeners. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Mike Ashcraft, pastor currently in Van Nuys, California. Pastor, man of God, your wife left everything to follow you in your dream. Are you going to leave her with nothing? The Bible says he who doesn't provide for his own is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. As men of God, we're ready to stand before God due to tragedy at any moment's notice. But what about our families? What happens to them if we were to die? There's an easy financial solution so that they don't have to go through poverty or destitution. Call me today, 310-403-6471. That's 310-403-6471. Thank you for listening to the Taking the Lion podcast. If you made it to this point, that means you're probably hungry for more sermons. This free version of the podcast only posts four messages per week and an incomplete version of Testimony Tuesday. If you're tired of missing out, then please check out the premium Taking the Land podcast, linked in the show notes. For only $3 a month, you'll get interruption and ad-free listening experience, early releases every day to start your day right, sermons will appear in your feed by 6 a.m. in the U.S., full versions of Testimony Tuesday, International Thursday and Study Day Saturday to ensure you have daily messages to satisfy your soul. Access to the premium subscription WhatsApp group, now with over 75 fellow subscribers from around the world. Finally, the best reason to subscribe. All proceeds go to world evangelism. We don't take a dime. Last year, we gave over $5,500 to support missionaries all around the world. Until next time, we wish you Godspeed as you pursue His will for your life wherever you are serving Him. Keep taking the land.